Welcome, everybody. I am uh, Mike Rice. I uh, use he, him pronouns and the development director uh, here at NOFA Mass. Uh, you are attending Maximizing and Using Your Fabulous Culinary Herb Harvest with Amy Francis LeBlanc. Amy owns and runs White Hill Farm, a small certified organic vegetable and herb operation in Western Maine. She grows seedlings for area gardeners and farmers in the spring and participates in the local farmers uh, market year round. Amy's a lifetime member of Nova Mass and Mofka, a longtime volunteer at the Common Ground Fair, a master gardener, traveler, enthusiastic and adventurous cook. <clears throat> Before we jump in, I just have a few details to review with everybody. <clears throat> uh, Nova Mass is strengthening our commitment to racial equity and justice by examining whiteness and dismantling systems of white supremacy uh, that are part of many dominant systems, uh, including our food and agriculture systems. Um, we also want to honor the indigenous land stewards who are the original occupants of the land on which we're currently living, farming, and residing. Um, <clears throat> in case you haven't already identified the original stewards of the lands where you live and work, uh, I'll drop a link in the chat momentarily uh, that you can use to do so. And um, we want to call everyone, especially white allies and co-conspirators to action on a few items to assist BIPOC-led organizations. Some ways to answer uh, that call to action are listed on this slide. And then finally, I also want to highlight two events that are taking place um, during the conference uh, for uh, BIPOC attendees and for Spanish speakers. And those event details are here on this slide as well. Uh, we have a number of sponsors who help make our conference possible. I encourage you to seek them out. And when you do, um, please let them know you appreciate their support for NOFA Mass. Be sure to check out our online auction. You can bid on some great items and support our work all at the same time. Um, I'll also drop a link to that chat that uh, in the chat momentarily, or you can always text NOFA to 855-202-2100 for a link to uh, check those items out. And also be sure to check out our virtual vendor listings. I'll drop that link in a moment as well. Um, lots of great information on that page and also some uh, uh, discount codes from some of our vendors for conference attendees. And then finally, I just want to thank all of you for spending the weekend with us. And uh, thanks especially to our NOFA members who make our education and advocacy work possible. And at this point, I will turn it over to Amy. Thank you. And um, thanks for the adventurous cook intro. Um, I've embarked on a diet for health reasons in the last year, and it's been an adventure. And herbs and spices have proven to be the absolute ticket to satisfaction. So. Um, I'll go right to my share screen. And I'd like to talk about a lot of different herbs where we grow in the Western foothills in Maine. We are either, well, we're kind of zone four or five, depending on the weather and on the day. And we start seedlings in our attached greenhouse. And when the weather lightens up a bit, we move out to our uh, high tunnel and we build small greenhouses inside the high tunnel with plastic up and over tables and we heat the small spaces. This way it's easy to get outside in late March or early April. Uh, this is a little bit of an idea of why, of, of how we grow. We're entirely in raised beds. You can see the hill structure on, the, on our land. This is one fall when I did an exceptionally good job of cleaning up and mulching and cover cropping. Um, one of the things that people say sometimes is, 
well, why do you plant herbs? And I think that the easiest answer is because they're part of a system. And part of the system is the person. I like to see different things in my garden, not just rows of herbs. So we use herbs because they can be beautiful, because they're part of companion planting, because they are useful for insect repelling and making teas and enjoying the history of making teas and of using herbs, especially things like the spice road. And by the way, it enhances our diet. And I'll talk a lot about individual herbs and I'm gonna start with basil. I'll try to cover how to some growing and some preserving and some using with every single one of the herbs that I go through. Um, we, we do a lot of companion planting with basil, uh, primarily amongst our peppers because there's not a lot of competition for soil nutrition. And here you go, right from the start. One of the things that's never dealt with adequately, at least in my opinion, in books about herbs and growing and using them is how to harvest them. There's ubiquitous words like harvest when the dew has dried from the plant. And that's it. So one of the recommendations is never to let things blossom because the chemistry of the plant changes when it goes into seed, flower and seed mode. So always trying to prevent things from blossoming. And with basil, which is very frisky in the blossoming department, pruning routinely for those tops is important. And you can see the scissors here poised right above the parallel growing mode. And many, many herbs have this parallel growing node. And you can see in the lower left and the upper right, after you've trimmed off that top stem, you get vigorous new growth. You've doubled your plant every time. And they do get bigger and then you do it again. We use um, basil for infused vinegars and for pesto. And if you are a pesto aficionado, I recommend the Everleaf variety from Johnny's. It's a very compact plant and it blooms very late. Not so good for bunching if you do farmer's market, but it's fabulous for pesto and drying. Nice big ones. You can see where that was cut. We use um, Excalibur dehydrators because they're fast. They move a lot of air. And we get a lot of good leaf. And I recommend that you use a double bagging system for storing dried herbs in a single bag, even in the double bag over time, but in a single bag, the herbs will rehydrate. And you should store whole leaf because when you crush leaves, they immediately begin to deteriorate. The infused vinegar is a great seller at farmer's market. We use it for our own salad dressings. Uh, green basil and red basil infused in vinegar is stunningly beautiful. And occasionally we grow lemongrass and it's a perennial. It can go into the polytunnel in the summer and back into the greenhouse or by a good sunny window for the winter. It's easy to grow in large pots if you have a place to bring them in and you harvest by cutting a fat stem right at the soil level. And then you use that in your favorite Thai recipes. Rosemary is a really tricky perennial and pruning lesson is the same as basil. You trim above the side-by-side -side growing nodes. And then you're rewarded with that double growth. And um, 
when we get back to the uh, screen where you can actually see my whole room, we've got rosemaries that I purchase and bring on into organic production. Starting from cuttings is difficult so far, but I'm getting better at it. And um, the trick with rosemary is that it doesn't have any patience. When you bring it in, in the wintertime, it will have done a lot of growing in the summer and it may very well have used up all the room and the soil and in the pot. And with little warning, it will begin to use a lot of water and then suddenly deteriorate. And at this point, a triage cut, which is to cut the plant down further than you think you should, and then repotting will usually bring it back. And don't hesitate because if they're done, they're done, which is too bad. And here's a beautiful example of an oregano that is just in dire need of a haircut. Because it's a member of the mint family, it also has side-by-side -side growing nodes and trimming above a node will double the plant top, but especially take off those blossoms as the chemistry of the plant changes. So there's the growing nodes and there's those blossoms off. And the, the blossoms go in the compost and I have some recipes where it's okay to use the oregano after it's begun to bloom because the oregano is not the feature of the recipe, but I would recommend trying very, very hard to prevent blossoming. And here's what it looks like after that good haircut. And oregano is an example of an herb that's more easily dried on the stem. And you shouldn't try to strip off all those many, many leaves for dehydrating. So we store our dried rosemary on the stem and strip the leaves just before using them. That means you need space. And in our, in our place, we have enough room on the north wall of our garage to put shelving and that place is the coolest place all year long. And here's another mint family member, thyme. This one is the uh, silvery thyme. One of our favorites is the lemon thyme. German thyme, of course, is the basic one. And creeping thyme is lots of fun to grow. It'll move around in your lawn so that when you're mowing, you, you get the wonderful aroma. It's far too picky to try to take off individual leaves, much worse even than oregano. So we have what we call the off with its head method, where we literally take a handful and cut down, leaving at least a third of the growth below where we're cutting. And then you end up with a delightful handful of fresh herb that can be dehydrated. And like oregano, you should store it on the stem after it's dried and then find a way to rub the leaves off when you need to use them. Uh, I found that the trays in our dehydrator have a nice mesh that's just about perfect for rubbing dried thyme stems to release the leaves. The leaves fall right through the mesh and there's minimal cleanup. In addition to lots of different herb recipes for soups and stews, we also use thyme for a refreshing tea. We've just begun to enjoy thyme tea a few times a week. And there's a plant with a nice haircut. I think that one's a lemon thyme. Chives are actually the very first herb crop every year for us. Um, 
we we give a good trim down about two thirds of the plant of the leaves, the clump, and it doesn't set the plant back. And you can take a look at those scissors. That's one of the craziest tools that I ever bought about 10 years ago when I when they first came out. And it gives you professional appearing chives. It's kind of nice. And it's quick. Now there is a problem with chives and dill is the same problem and chervil is the same problem. I call this a green air herb. It loses so much water in the dehydrating process that it will literally fly all over inside the dehydrator. So we use these uh, zip closed lingerie laundry bags to put the chives and those other herbs like, like chervil in particular and dillweed also to prevent them from flying around inside the dehydrator. Here's another terrible blossom. Now, if you cut sage blossoms when they're still in color, they're beautiful for dried flower arrangements but then the plants are more difficult to maintain and you really would like not to allow them to go to flower early in the season. The growing nodes are not regular like basil or oregano or rosemary, but the same technique you use is to cut directly above the node and you will be rewarded with all new growth. Sage is not an herb that I particularly prefer, but it's wonderful for a tea. So if you haven't tried that, that's also a nice, a nice way to use it. And this particular cut did have a parallel growing node and you can see the two beautiful new tops. Tarragon has growth nodes that are stepwise, not at all parallel. Still, you can isolate a node and cut above it the same way. You can see the zigzag there, sometimes left, sometimes right. and find a place to snip right above a growing node. We use this one for one of our many infused vinegars as well. And there are people who've discovered that it's absolutely fabulous. You can do uh, vinegar infusions very easily. We have half gallon jars lining all the counters in my garden kitchen with uh, the leftovers from making jams and jellies and, the, and all manner of herbs, including even calendula blossoms. And I did forget to say back in my little comments about chives, after that first cut, that major cut of chives every year, we allow the plants to blossom because chive blossom infused white wine vinegar is fabulous. Now here's another growth habit that's entirely different. You can see how the big leaf in the center comes up from a sheath on the stem and the new growth emerges from that sheath. And if you cut that little beautiful tender leaf, you will stop the growth of your dill plant. So you cut only the large growth. The plants will get really scraggly and tall and finally go to seed. But if you prune routinely, you can have a wonderful harvest of dill weed. Choosing the best variety of dill for leaf production is important. The variety that's called bouquet seems to be fairly reliable. And 
Then if you're gonna go for seed, you choose a larger and faster maturing variety like mammoth. And if you're going to harvest dill weed, it's great to do succession planting, like a short row every week. And then you'll always have fresh herbs. Now, I don't have a picture of cilantro, but I just wanted to mention that cilantro is one of the ones that you seriously, really do seriously need to do succession planting. Uh, I kind of joke that you need to go to whatever your church is on Sunday. And when you come back from church, you plant a short row of cilantro. And by the end of the season, those first plantings will give you a secondary crop of coriander seeds. But in the meantime, you'll have enough cilantro for all your salsas and other things. You're gonna find that there are some interesting ways to preserve herbs that are not dehydrating. There are some herbs that get used repeatedly uh, for the same recipe. And here we love dill butter on baked potatoes. And so we preserve fresh dill directly in the butter for uh, for baked potatoes and boiled potatoes. Now, of course, the trick is, is that you melt the butter and then you let it cool because if you put dill into hot butter, you immediately cook it into spines and uh, that doesn't work. So the cooled butter, and then you can freeze it in portions. Other herbs can also be snipped into ice cube trays and frozen in the cubes for later use in soups and sauces and stews. Uh, the fourth major growth habit is a rosette from the base. And I usually have someone say, oh, that's why my parsley stopped growing. There really is a, a, a trick to harvesting parsley. And if you take your hands and go right down into that plant, you'll discover the new growth in the center. Chervil is another one that does this dramatically. Um, if you cut those little ones, the plant will stop. So you cut only the big ones. Parsley, if you dehydrate it, uh, does really well with the main stems cut off and uh, then we crush it just before we use it. Chervil is specifically for one recipe that I make that we really enjoy. It's called salad sprinkles and it's uh, a salt-free seasoning that has uh, sesame seeds and chervil, which has a very, very gentle licorice-like flavor. And chervil, the same thing, only the outer leaves can be harvested. This one is another mint family. Um, it can become invasive because it is very, very good at self-seeding. This is lemon balm. It's pruned the same way as the other mint family members. And there's a good demonstration of the parallel growing nodes. And when you do take off the top, you're retarding the uh, blossoming, which means you're lessening the uh, self-seeding. And then you get this riot of wonderful new growth. Lemon balm is used in some baking and to make a tasty tea. Chamomile is one of our favorite flowering herbs, and this too will self-seed. I don't think I've planted it for about 10 years. I mean, intentionally. Um, sometimes I 
pick up some seedlings and move them where they've come up naturally in the garden. And uh, you need to wait until the blossoms are full and round and fat if you're going to harvest them for tea. And obviously, uh, they're also very lightweight. This is another one that we dry in lingerie bags. I have to begin again with uh, lemon verbena. This is another perennial that needs to go out in the uh, polytunnel for the summer and back in in the winter. And uh, this is a fantastic, fantastic addition to teas. We have a recipe for a lemon verbena and mint green tea blend that's really nice. It's a little bit picky. It's prone to spider mites. And if you're a house plant aficionado, you know how dangerous those can be. So this is one of the plants that can bring in all kinds of visitors when you bring it in in the fall. So we tend to kind of try to do a good cleaning job and kind of isolate these before they sort of come into the main population. Uh, and if need be, then we resort to standard issue safer soap and alcohol and that sort of thing for getting rid of spider mites. And uh, lemon verbena is kind of cool. It doesn't have parallel, it has triple growing nodes. And the pruning method is the same, but you then get triple the growth after pruning. And that's, sorry, it's out of focus, but you can sure see the three new sprouts after the cut. Lemon verbena is one of the herbs that has the strongest lemon flavor and scent. And uh, we also grow um, a lemon basil and lemon thyme, and they all get used for fish seasonings. Uh, I know that a lot of folks just have mint and then they get really mad at it because it's so invasive. So we've solved that by growing ours in old tractor tires. And we get a fabulous spread and fabulous harvest. And I can mow around the tires and prevent it from being um, invasive. And you can see in this picture, the close up of the mesh in the Excalibur dehydrator trays. And that's how the thyme leaves will fall right through that mesh, making that harvest easy. We also store mint whole leaf uh, on the stem because that prevents deterioration. And when it's time to make tea, we strip it off. And sometimes I store it whole leaf on the stem and sometimes after we've stripped it. And again, here's that double bag. Now uh, this one has the silly initials on the bottom, NPNI, which means it's not processed and not in my harvest inventory. So that is on the stem and it will be put into my harvest inventory when we take it off the stem. Um, I'd like to talk about repelling insects for a few minutes. There's a, a wonderful pair of books. Um, which one is it? Garlic Loves Tomatoes or Garlic and Roses. I can't remember the title, that's silly. Um, and I'll just find it because they're, um, herbs are smelly and some of them, apparently bugs really don't like them. 
And for the last three or four years, we've been experimenting with sage. And actually I've grown nasturtiums for years to in, to, as uh, companions to tomatoes in particular, and also in cucumbers and in squashes. But we've been experimenting with sage and catnip. And catnip is a perennial. It overwinters very easily in our raised beds. And I'm just gonna say that in my experience in the last three years, I have had almost zero squash bugs. And that's the first time that's ever happened. So I'm hoping that will continue. I'm going to continue to plant catnip, um, probably at least a plant near the base of every hill of every squash and every cucumber. It seems to deter striped cucumber beetles. Although we we always plant like the 5th or the 7th or the 10th of June. So we're always planting seedlings a little late. So I don't usually have a lot of trouble with cucumber beetles. So my vote is out on that for the moment, but definitely the squash bugs do not like catnip. So then the bonus is you get cat toys. And I did mention nasturtiums. Those are uh, also a deterrent for bugs. They don't exactly compete with squashes and cucumbers. They'll crawl around as the vines on the other plants crawl around, but they manage to peek up and blossom beautifully without taking over. Uh, one exception is there is one that's called a tall nasturtium that actually is designed to vine, and I would not use that one for companion planting as it can take over and um, destroy the plant, the crop plants. The bonus of nasturtiums, of course, is that uh, the blossoms are gorgeous and edible. We put them in our salads. The leaves are edible and nobody bothers nasturtiums. This particular picture doesn't have a B, which is too bad. I'll have to do a better job and get another picture to replace this one because they're great for attracting pollinators. Not only are the leaves and the blossoms edible, but so are the seed pods. And if you have recipes, especially we do, deviled eggs, that takes chopped up capers, you can make capers out of the seed pods of nasturtiums. They have a nice peppery bite, just like capers, and they sure don't cost as much. We use a standard issue dill pickle brine to pickle the uh, nasturtium seeds. Another one that's just plain beautiful as a companion, I don't believe it actually has insect repelling capabilities, but it's just plain gorgeous, is uh, calendula. I don't personally make any cosmetic products, so I don't use the calendula to its fullest um, ability. The emollient stems, uh, when, when I'm harvesting blossoms to make infused vinegars or to eat the bug, eat the petals in my salad. I have to wash with um, a, a brush because the uh, residue from the stems is very sticky, giving a demonstration of how it's used for creams with that emollient capability. So we use the petals fresh in salads and also for making infused vinegar, which is actually just mildly floral, but it's an, it's an interesting flavor.
And if you're a baker and would like to have your own poppy seeds, this is a gorgeous, gorgeous crop. Um, I never get enough planted. I try to plant them in the fall as if I'm pretending that Mother Nature just dropped them out of a seed head. But if you're growing the bread seed varieties, they do not self seed. So you gotta step in and do it. The regular ones have little vents at the top. And if you look around the base of that crown on the top of the seed pod, you can see there are no openings. Right at the very top, right under that crown, there will be a whole row of little windows like around at the top of the Empire State Building or uh, Lady Liberty. And if it's not a bread seed variety, the wind will seed those poppies right there and you won't get the seeds for your own baking. Bread seed ones with the closed windows will give you a good crop of seeds, plus they're gorgeous. Now I need to talk about garlic for a while because it's a major, major crop for us. Uh, in the raised beds, this is what it looks like uh, probably just after cutting off the garlic scapes. And there's a big mystique about garlic that is kind of unfounded. If you've ever successfully planted a tulip bulb or a daffodil bulb, that's all you have to do to plant garlic. Uh, it's after it comes up in the spring that you need to be careful. It doesn't like competition. So weeding it is absolutely essential. And that's part of the reason for that mulch. When it's planted in the fall, we cover it up good and proper with the straw mulch. And then because we have free range chickens, I have to put bird netting over the top of it, but it works out, it's, it's not a problem. And uh, then it does need to be kept weed free in order to get the bulbs to be big. And then when the scapes come up, the blossom stalks in the late June, uh, early July, they need to be cut off because leaving them on the plant looks cool, but it will divert the plant's energy from growing the bulbs to their full size. So cutting them off, well, they're edible. So we make them into pickles and into green garlic powder and into another Cuisinart product, which is to grind them up in olive oil to freeze because there are so many recipes that start with olive oil and garlic. And there it is, all set, ready to go in your freezer. We also use the, we call it garlic goo or oobleck. You should read your Dr. Seuss oobleck book. It's the same color, uh, this garlic goo is the same color as oobleck. Um, we mix it with butter to make garlic bread and it's fairly delicious. So we grind the scapes with water and make a slurry and it goes into the dehydrator and comes out as green garlic powder. That's much milder than um, garlic powder made from the bulbs. Now, of course, if you want to, those scapes are perfectly edible, fresh. We use them in stir fries also, which is a, a nice treat. So I'm sure some of you have garlic gadgets. This is the only one that's worth buying for helping skin garlic. And I'm sure you can see the texture on this little tube. Inside are little fingers that actually grab the peels of the garlic while you're working with it to take them off. There are some of these out that have plain uh, innards. 
they work, but it takes twice as much work. So if you've done pickling in August or September, you'll find that the skins on your garlic are leathery and will not come off this way and you have to use a knife to cut the root end off and to get the skins off. But when they've dried, and just a few days ago, I skinned out a whole bunch and put it in the dehydrator to make garlic powder out of the bulb. And literally you roll it in there and it comes out naked. It is so quick. Then we have another tool uh, there. This is the original one called chop and measure. Uh, there are some knockoffs that are actually okay. And uh, this is the right tool for the job, but it has a problem, which is that rotating bit where the top comes down to actually do the chopping has plastic and it's breakable. So we just have a protocol to keep, because I've broken them, I figured out how not to break them. So it's a wonderful tool and it does that. Instantaneous little tiny cubes without getting your fingers all gross. And then it goes in the dehydrator. There's another chance to look at that little, the, on the left, the corner where the lid comes down to do the pressing. Those plastic knobs are breakable. And I said before that we use Excalibur dehydrators. My 40 year old one has had a new motor and it is simple to repair, maintain and repair. And we have four of them. One of them is running right now with garlic in it. And uh, if you're going to buy a dehydrator, I highly recommend Excalibur. And no, I don't have stock in the company, <laughs> but they operate with low heat. They have a thermostat and they move a lot of air, which is the secret to getting the job done to get green herbs. And another product that we rely on is this little guy. They're not expensive and they do exactly what it says, spice and nut grinder. We grow our own paprika as well. And I actually should have had photos in here of that. And I, I apologize. So I will tell you what we do uh, with that. But this is another example of the right tool to do the job. And since we've been growing garlic to sell in many forms for many, many years, we've settled on some things that just seem to do the job right. And this is another one. So in this, on the subject of paprika, I'll just put in a, a little paragraph here. Uh, we grow our peppers in our polytunnel, but with the sides up and all of that, lots of ventilation in the summer. And we grow some very specific varieties. Uh, the one called Bulldog, B-O-L-D-O-G, is the standard Hungarian. And it's very strong flavored. You can find lots of different ones that are labeled sweet. And if you like a blend so that your paprika powder, when you've done the harvesting and the grinding, when the paprika powder is uh, blended. If you'd like it to have a little bit of a kick, you need to have something with some heat. And there are some hot varieties out there that will give you that little bit of a kick. One of the problems with, with um, paprika is that you don't get much for your effort because the peppers are designed to dry easily, so they're very thin. And when you take them out of the dehydrator, you'll discover that it doesn't go very far. So we never grow enough, but I grow enough to grind and be able to sell 100% certified organic paprika out of our own garden. And it is a blend, so it has a kick to it. Okay, there you go. That's back to this guy in action. So with the paprika, we seed it, 
and we put it in the dehydrator in strips and then we break the strips into the same machine into the spice and nut grinder and it makes a beautiful paprika powder just like this. One of the important things about gardening wherever you are is to take care of your uh, garden year round. And I don't always get as good a job done, but we use these marigolds as row markers and uh, use various cover crops and um, sometimes cover crops in the fall. We also take our own grass clippings and turn them into mini hay for mulching during the season. And then we put them down green on the beds in the fall to cover for the winter and squelch herbs. These are gem marigolds, and this is another edible flower. Uh, I guess you can consider this a summer herb, uh, another good one for salads and that sort of thing. And there's that picture again. The marigolds are like the canary in the mine shaft and they are the last to go. And you can see the things that look dead. That's all marigolds. And to the left is a late planted buckwheat, the scraggly bed. And that's one of my favorite pictures. So that's the end of the um, slide part and I'll see if I can get out of this and come back to real life. There's a bunch of questions in the chat I see so we can talk about them all. Ah, there. So Mike, you can direct, yeah. some, direct some question answering. Thank you so much, that was great. Amen. I'm going to stand up for just a second and get that horrible rosemary. <laughs> so um, one question that came up, and I know that uh, the one of the documents that we'll share at the end has some references and recommended reading, but one question was just regarding if you have any favorite books. So if you'd like to just save that for the the uh, the sheet we'll share, that's fine, but I, I just wanted to give you the opportunity to to um, call out anything you'd like here. Well, I, there are two that are the top of the list and one that's new to me. Uh, these are all referenced in, in the, in the uh, list of books that I made. Um, if you're a beginning gardener, I would recommend the Great Garden Companions book, uh, Sally Jean Cunningham. She's a Cornell uh, master gardener. And it's a fabulous book that's all organic and not preachy at all. So, you know, sometimes people are a little put off by um, um, things being pushed, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Uh, it is all about a beautiful garden, all about a utilitarian garden, growing what you want it to grow, but to be beautiful and to use companion planting for that whole list of reasons I tried to say. And, um, <clears throat> and others as well. So uh, I recommend it for every beginning gardener. Uh, on the other hand, I recommend it for all experienced gardeners as well. And if you uh, look down the list and find that it's out there, it's published, it's, it's available in bookstores and on Amazon with no issues. Uh, the other one is the Thomas DiBaggio book from Seed Cutting and Root. And it it's literally covers all the bases for propagation, whether it's seeding and growing advice, but also about propagating and problem solving. And I, I really appreciate that one a lot. Yeah. Um, great. And, and yeah, I'll, I'll uh, share that document with those and others momentarily. Um, 
Next question is, uh, I have a young lavender plant in a large pot that I'm wintering inside. It's browning and I think it's the lack of sun. Is it okay to use a grow light on a young lavender plant indoors until it goes out in the spring? I would definitely try it. We have, um, eh, I get a little testy about the prices of things. So I have found a less expensive alternative to grow lights but you have to hunt. Um, if someone is interested in doing this, uh, you'll have to send me an email, <clears throat> which is also on the handouts and ask me about the lighting because I, I don't have the spectrum indicate the numbers in front of me. We are using what we call the red and blue combination of lights in an ordinary uh, four foot shop light to um, enhance lighting in the in our glass house. Now true it's a south facing glass house, but it gets so full that we have to do um, additional lighting and I've found that the full spectrum approach works really, really well. Uh, the other thing is that if it's a well, I guess the question is to the to, to the person who asked the question, did you dig it up or has it always been in the pot? Thank Feel you. free to come off mute and. Uh... Hmm? Hi, I'm the person that asked the question. Thank yeah. you for letting me <laughs> yeah. take over. Um, thank you so much for your presentations. Amazing. Um, so the lavender plant has always been in a pot. Um, it was given to me as a gift uh, two years ago as a little seedling in a pot around Christmas time. And it was beautiful and green in the pot around in Christmas of 2020 and it just has and I never put it in the ground it was it just never really got very big in the in the little pot but so this past um this past winter I actually did repot it in a much much larger pot um that's 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 giving it a whole lot of room um and okay. brought it inside. But I, I don't know if it's possible that it also just didn't survive the repotting. Well, um, hang on a second. I'm gonna grab a book real quick. Because lavender will not grow on my property. We have this south facing hill and it does the uh, freeze and thaw, freeze and thaw thing all winter long and lavender hates that. And I mean, it hates it. And uh, garden cultivation in winter indoors, 145. I'm just gonna look real quick. This is the book that's new to me. And um, I figured there might be an answer to your question here. And this book is referred to in the, um, Handout, it's the complete book of herbs and spices. It's been around a while. Uh, the author is Sarah Garland. And um, it says pruning to keep them compact, cut off runners. Okay, if you pot it up into a very much larger pot, probably it's struggling to get its roots under it. Mm, that could be it. Yeah, the pot is much, much larger. I just, I wanted to give it a whole lot of room, but it's, I, it, it's still, you know, it's pretty young. So I'm, I am wondering if maybe I, yeah, maybe something is happening with that, but it's also not getting any direct light. Well, then I would take care of that first and yeah. be sure not to overwater. Absolutely. One of, one of the first problems um, with indoor stuff is overwatering. And um, I have a, always have some young person, a teenager working with me, and there are plants that I don't allow them to water and um, herbs and particularly basil are on that list because in the wintertime, indoors they're just really tender so i wish you luck with it and i wish i knew more about lavender that's an oh, incredible thank transition yeah thank you thank you so much
Yeah. Considering that you're not looking at the chat, because our next question is, what is your winter watering routine for the tender perennial herbs you bring inside? <laughs> okay. Well, I have a tip the pot routine. So let me put this up here. That means I literally go and I do this. And if it feels light, I give it a drink. But every Sunday, I do my watering and I tip the pot every time. And if it's lightweight, I'll water everything and come back and give that one another drink. And I do have a couple of rosemaries right now that are in that they're starting to drink a lot of water. So I know that I'm gonna to need to repot them sometime during this winter. Uh, the general, I'm not saying this is a rule, but the general recommendation is to only go up incrementally when you repot herbs. That's, uh, like I said, that's the general recommendation. So once a week, I guess, is the answer to the answer to the question. We also grow an incredible number of succulents. And uh, I make succulent gardens to sell at market. And um, they're once a week. It works out beautifully. Yep. Great. That's the last of the questions in the chat at this point. If anybody uh, has had something come up or has another question, feel free to just come off mute and ask it directly. Actually, hi, I, my name is Heather um, and I can't thank you enough for this wonderful presentation. I've, these are things that I, these are plants that I work with a lot and you've just answered a ton of questions oh. for me. So this was enormously helpful. Thank you so much. I do have, and I'm gonna probably embarrass myself a little bit. Um, and we've, we've all been there, go for it. Thank God, because, <laughs> I have um, I have a, a very large beds, and I'm in, uh, involved in school gardens. And we have very large beds, and we have taken in uh, some rosemary that has overgrown. I was able to take it into the greenhouse last winter and put it out into the gardens again in the spring, and it did pretty well over the summer. And so I redug them up and brought them into the greenhouse, and I noticed. In particular, uh, rose rosemary. I'm sorry. Um, gets really. Um, it just does not seem to do well in the greenhouse. So, is it worth my while to just trim it down, as you had mentioned about rosemary, down to a very woody portion and just let it sit in the greenhouse? Or I'm not really sure. It's just looking. Oh, it's just concerning. And I'm also going to be doing a ton of seeding in the greenhouse, and I worry that perhaps some of the mm -hmm bugs that might have gravitated toward the soil will be a problem for us as we start our seeding in the greenhouse. Anything you could share would be a gift. Um, I lose rosemaries just like everybody else does. Uh, hopefully, thankfully, not often, but I lose them. Yeah. Um, digging them up repeatedly is a huge amount of stress. And I keep mine in really big pots and pot them up usually once a year, but only, you know, only incrementally. So I'm not going up to a huge pot wow. because of, I, I've had the experience of trying to dig them and then promptly losing them. So since you've already dug it up, I would give it a bit of a triage cut, cut it back. If there's anybody living there, hitchhikers, you can eliminate them <laughs> um, and use the herb. And then just very carefully monitor the moisture because if it's really pot bound, doesn't sound like it is, but if it were pot bound, it would use an incredible amount of water and need to be potted up. Okay. If it's not pot bound and just struggling, removing all that top foliage might give it the window it needs to do a job of recovering. Super, very helpful. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. We have a question uh, from Mary in the chat who asks, with an unfenced herb garden, would stinging nettle planted at the edges deter deer and other pests? Okay, I have no clue. 
honest to goodness. Um, I am terrified I get an overreaction to stinging nettle. So I have not experimented with it. I've removed it assiduously from our property. And I know there are lots of benefits that can be derived from it. But if I get into it, I'm whatever got into it is paralyzed. So I just, I just keep it away. Um, that's a good question for your extension agent about deterring deer. Um, my funniest deer story was just two or three years ago. And I honest to goodness went to dig my carrots and one of my beds had been salad. And they had taken off all the green tops and taken a bite out of every single carrot. And, uh, and you saw the raised beds. Uh, that particular photo with the raised beds was actually where this happened. That's the closest to the woods. And thankfully, our daughter-in-law does pressure canning, and she was able to can all the carrots. But uh, deer is a problem. And the only thing that I know for a fact works is double fencing. And um, once you do that, you're done. They, they can't get in. So I wish you the best of luck. And if you learn something, pass it along. Hello, my name is Donna. And I'd like to ask a question. I have taken a plant, uh, a poppy plant from my son's home a couple of times and I can't seem to get it to stay happy here. I put it in a pot originally to figure I'd give, you know, I'd bring it indoors, but it, it didn't survive. Is there something, some, I live in uh, Taunton, <clears throat> I, uh, which is, you know, closer to province. I don't know if you think I should, you know, is there a different variety I could try or? Poppies are not perennial. They are, okay. they are annuals. So. Uh, See, his plant is not. His plant comes back, but that's Virginia, of course. Okay, well, then I don't know about that one. So I'm going to have to look it up. Do you know its yeah. name? No, I don't. Because he it was there when he got the property. And he, because he teases me every year and sends me pictures of how it's expanding and growing. <laughs> well, it, it may be that it's self-seeding. Uh, and I don't know that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm just going to look it up. We have them that uh, self seed because I love to look at them. And when they have their open vents uh, around the top, then they self seed enthusiastically. And then I do grow the bread seed ones and those do not self seed at all. You have to break them and, and, and seed them yourself. Um, okay, it does say that there are some that are, okay, it says, here's the Latin styliform. These are short-lived perennials, and most gardeners grow them as annuals. So that means that your son's place must be just the optimum exposure for them. Right, because there is one, just one part of the garden that you know he that he has, and he basically ignores it. But <laughs> he has th thinned out around there, so maybe that's why they're doing a little bit better. But yeah, yeah, they just don't well, seem to like it up here. What you should do is get seed. Okay. And if they're the kind that have open vents, you're going to have to be right on it or ask him to be right on it. Because when mm -hmm. those open, the seed is ready to be dispersed and they should be cut and uh, turned upside down in a jar so, so that you actually get the, uh, get the seed. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Heather asks in the chat, uh, do you have a recommended um, source for poppy seed to plant? Uh, it looks like Johnny's doesn't have it. Uh, yeah, well, I fruition seeds was not at the tip of my tongue, but somebody added to the chat that fruition seeds sells the Briar bread seed, the uh, Zyre bread seed. Um, Fedco does also. And um, Southern Exposure and Baker Creek. I think Solstice, which is in Vermont. 
there are others, but those are the ones that pop to mind. Great. And be sure to check uh, to see if high mowing does as well, because if they do, you can pop over to the vendor marketplace and they've uh, included a discount code for attendees to use. Well, I'm looking it up. California orange, oh, black beauty. That one's, ah, oh, we've had that one self seed. Yes, they do have poppies, black beauty, California orange, one called Piro, which is red and Plena Rouge, it's a purple one that's actually gorgeous. Um, I don't see one that is advertised as a bread seed. And it says right on it, prefers poor soil. So go check out the, the code for high mowing. Thank you for that tip. I should do that too. Anybody else having a question come up? Um, I was just going to invite another bit of a conversation if uh, people were interested about paprika, because I honest to goodness didn't even think of it. And I did totally leave this out. Um, we've had um, really, really good luck with growing paprika. If you can grow hot peppers well, the paprika will grow in that same type of exposure. Uh, the hard part is, is you don't get much. And I, I said that before, I know. So if you're going to attempt to grow some paprika to actually have some to enjoy, you need to plant more than one plant. I would plant two or three varieties and two or three of each and just enjoy it. And a good dehydrator will take care of prepping it for grinding it. So it's, it's a wonderful thing to grow. Yeah. So I wanted to put this terrible plant up so you could see this right in front of me because I'm going to cut that off right in front of everybody. This is in such bad need of a haircut. It looks so much better. <laughs> and this wonderful bit is going to get dehydrated and used for food. So don't feel the least bit of compunction about doing this. There's about six or eight little cuts left on this plant. And then it'll get to be looking like the big bushy one that's behind me. So, Keegan, I see that you're off mute. Did you have a question? Maybe. I just muted you in case that was a mistake. If you do have a, something to say, feel free to come back off mute. Uh, in the meantime, Karen in the chat says, what do you use besides water in watering your plants? Oh, good question. Uh, I use a fish emulsion at extremely low uh, amounts. I put enough in my big watering can that it just looks like a really, like you put a little bit of milk in your tea. So it's not much. And I only do that about once every three weeks. Uh, gives things a little bit of a boost, especially the potted herbs and they do appreciate it. That works. Yeah. Mike, is there a vendor that we, um, for NOFA that has that? I'm sure there are probably many. <laughs> um, Neptune's Harvest is a is always a supporter um, of NOFA. They're not um, in our vendor marketplace this year, but they do they did uh, donate a five gallon fish uh, emulsion bucket to the auction that you can um, check out if you need lots and lots of it. Um, there's a product called Fish Hydrosolate with Kelp which is um, available through Fedco through in their organic grower supply. Uh, for some reason, it says no sales to New Hampshire. I don't understand that. But it comes in a gallon and it's, uh, oh, 
And we have, we um, usually purchase the five gallon drum and just use it till it's gone, which takes years and years. But that's a good product that I use, so. Um, hi, I'm Sherry from um, Massachusetts. We recently moved here from Ohio and I wanna start putting some herb beds in. We're gonna put some raised beds in, we're growing. And right now our medium is un unfortunately compacted topsoil from all the growing, I mean, from, from all the building. Um, so what, what kind of soil, what kind of amendments, what should I put into my raised beds to get these herbs started and give them their optimal uh, start in life? Well, if you have compacted soil, you're not going to be able to get much. I would consider, which is what we have done, uh, bringing in soil to fill the beds. Um, mine take about two cubic yards, which is a dollar sign. But we've been able to access um, a raised bed mix from a certified organic farmer. And it's what he calls his um, raised bed mix, which is a combination of soil and well composted cow manure. And um, if you need to plant directly into the soil that you have, I would go on a serious campaign of loosening and adding organic matter. And that can be uh, dried grass clippings with no seed heads. It can be peat moss. It can be compost that you purchase, anything to get in and improve, and improve the tilth. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah, no, we were considering that we would have to purchase something to, to fill these beds, but. Um, yeah, I would, I would hunt around, use, you, you're, you are in Massachusetts, right? Yes. Yeah, I would hunt around starting with ask at NOFA. Is there a source? <laughs> Is there a source for reviewed raised bed filling blend, which it would probably be, and uh, find some places because it's it's actually for I consider it a buy once situation because we do because of the raised beds minimal tilling. I like to joke that I have a tractor. It's a big one. It's called a pitchfork. Mm -hmm. And we add um, grass mulch in the winter as a cover, green grass in the winter as a cover, and that all gets dug in. It all gets dug in mm -hmm. of the mulch that we use in the, during the growing season as our own grass clippings. And then we add a, kind of a soup that we make out of rock powders and azomite. And then, you know, there's always this recommendation to do a soil test and find out what your baseline is in the soil. And that will, that's, that's the best idea. If you bring in soil, ask for a soil test if they have it or get one immediately if they don't. Thank you. Yep. A couple of resources to share, Sherry. Um, the first is the, the NOFA bulk order, which is open now until the end of the month. Um, and that is a source for soil and all, all, all other things you might need to get your beds started. Um, and then the second is that in our auction uh, I'm going through this conference, um, the Coast of Maine has donated a pallet of their raised bed mix soil. Uh, that includes uh, residential delivery. Um, so that's, I think, it's, uh, 48 uh, two cubic foot bags um, delivered to your house. Um, so that could be a really wow. nice thing for starting beds too. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. Great. Great. Thank you for all the ideas and information. This has been a great session. Well, thank you very much. And, and thank you, Mike, for stepping in. I'm glad you had that at your fingertips. <laughs> uh, folks can contact me anytime they'd like to. I, um, 
will answer emails. Just don't write a book, one or two questions. And if you are looking for creative recipes, we have um, uh, an organic, uh, uh, organic herb blend range that I sell at farmer's market that there's 60 items on it. And many things that use hot peppers and spices as well as herbs that we grow ourselves. And if you're intrigued with more recipes, you could ask me for something that's good for tacos or for something that's good for fajitas or something that's great for making Italian salad dressing or for oil dipping, bruschetta. If you are a baker, you might want the everything topping recipe, that kind of thing. I'm just saying that these things are out there and I'm willing to share and uh, help you enjoy your harvest. So thank you all for attending. And I just put two more links in the chat. One of them is the list of recommended books from Amy and the other is uh, some recipes. Excellent, thank you. Hi, Jan. Uh, Donna asks, can we order things via mail? From me? I imagine that's the question. Yes. Sure. The only problem is, is that we have to figure out postage. So, and if you, if you want a product list, I'll share that too. <laughs> we do mail things all the time. It's just that it's not, not as easy as it used to be. So. Jan, did you have a question? No, I was just saying hello to Amy. I haven't seen her and I, I'm thrilled we're able to connect on Zoom, but I miss the face-to-face. -face. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Well, <laughs> we'll get there at oh, some yeah. point. We'll get there. So hopefully we all stay hale and hearty in the meantime. And I love the, the quote, you know, gardening is great therapy and you get free tomatoes. So it's, it's good. <laughs> So does MOFCA know what they're going to do this year? Nobody uh, knows. Um, well, let's just put it this way. Since I'm on the fair steering committee, um, we tried. I know, I know. We tried. And yeah. we, the bulk of the, the most members of the fair steering committee said, you know what? The attitude and the way it is going in Maine for 21 just is not tenable. And so there was no backup. Yeah. And I thought that was silly, but aside from that, I'm not paying the bills up in the, at headquarters. So at this point, it's uh, all hands on deck, aiming, yeah. for, an, aiming for an in-person fair. Yeah. I hope I hope it I hope it comes about this year. Likewise, the NOFA summer conference, you know, exactly. being outdoors primarily. If we can do it somehow, you know, I know MOFCA has more outdoors than the NOFA summer conference does. But um, well, there's there's ways around that, all of which cost money. Which of yes, I know are, the tents hard rental money. tents is not inexpensive. You know? No, and uh, actually, if you gathered all your farmers market friends and said, "May I borrow your tents, all of them?" that kind of thing could help. But because it's on a weekend, that makes that difficult, also. So yeah, yeah, and uh, you know they have to make a living, especially in the summertime for our summer conference down here. That's some of the farmers have told me that's the busiest um, busiest weekend of the year for the. Um, in, in that first for weekend sales, of the sales. Yeah. Absolutely the busiest yeah. weekend of the year is where NOFA summer conference has been. Yeah. You know, not, not, uh, by the time MOFCA comes around, it's slowed down a little bit, but not a huge amount. Yep. It's still prime. Well, we're, we're trying to keep the faith. And like I said, at this point, it's all hands on deck. MOFCA is uh, soliciting food vendors and we in the exhibition hall are anticipating going back inside and doing the job right. Oh, I just love that exhibition hall. It's just so much fun, you know? <laughs> well, I invite everybody to make a weekend of it and to come over because uh, it is a unique event. But you also have to notice that I've been a Massachusetts uh, NOFA member for 20 years and have also been members of uh, Vermont and New Hampshire over the years because 
I value Nofa because it's very different from Mafka. Very different. And uh, so I appreciate this opportunity and appreciate everybody who's come to the class. Yeah, thank you so much um, for- Well, for all of the NOFAs want to grow up and be like MOFCA and have our own central location for our events and stuff, but uh, doesn't but, look like it's happening in any place besides MOFCA. So we'll just try to continue to support you to the best of our ability. Well, the priorities would change the minute you have a property to maintain. Uh, absolutely. The priorities change. So I will support the NOFAs forever because those they're not burdened by that by those priorities. Yes, I had forgot. Somebody did. I think New Jersey tried it a few years ago, and it did not work well. You know, it yeah. did not work well. Yep. You know, so, and land, of course, in Rhode Island, land is we're blessed with the most expensive, uh, expensive farmland in the country. So, <laughs> so Thanks. just figure the odds of buying a large enough property for. Uh, Jan, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, I have a few things to, to um, wrap up here and we're oh, coming. Oh, thank up you. I'm sorry. Back. I didn't mean to carry off. Um, <laughs> first link I'm going to share in the chat is to um, our evaluations. Now would be a great time to um, just go and quickly uh, do your evaluation for this course. We do really value that feedback. Um, the second link here is uh, to our vendor marketplace again, where you'll find those some of those discount codes we talked about earlier. There's the auction again, um, where there are a couple of relevant things in addition to the um, pallet of soil from coast of Maine that's there. There's also um, a, a package that has a gift certificate to the NOFA bulk order and also um, for some uh, soil test analysis from Nova Mass staff. So that could be an interesting one for folks getting ready to, um, to create new beds or, or, uh, or, or plant where you have already planted in the past. And um, the winter conference runs uh, today, Saturday from nine to 5.30. So we have sessions going the rest of the day and then 11 to 5.30 tomorrow we have some really exciting roundtables and also our keynote tomorrow. And then recordings, uh, everything's in your program book. So use that as your, as your guide to, uh, to navigating the whole conference. And then uh, recordings of everything will be available to attendees um, by Monday the 24th. So anything that you're not attending in person, you can catch up on then. Uh, Christy asked, are we allowed to connect with social handles? I love this community and would love to follow and learn. Absolutely, if anybody um, would like to, to drop ways to connect in the chat, um, feel free to do that. And then um, to save the chat, to save all that information after we close this, this uh, session, you'll click those three dots in your chat box and click save chat. And that is all I have. If anybody uh, has any final, um, questions or comments or things to share, feel free to do that. And then we will, uh, we will end this session shortly. Thank you all so much for attending.